Welcome to the teaching program. I hope you're comfortable there and that your spirit is open and let the Lord help you and teach you. In this special series that we are presenting, it has to do with the answer to problems that come to us and sometimes sorrows that come to us that we don't understand why they come. And especially in reacting to pain, painful things can come to us and we say, well now, if there's a God, <laughs> why does such and such a thing happen? And when we come to know that there, that there is a, a battle raging, a cosmic battle raging, that it, it's, it's raging in the world of the spirit, then we know that we must battle back, we must fight back. And when we learn to fight back, then we learn how to win. And, and then life becomes successful and resourceful and fulfilling. And all the things that you, you know, you aspire to, you reach for them. If you determine to receive something and to get something, you know, you start striving for it. So success in every way depends upon this. We've been teaching you from the big chart and we will start right in with it at this time. Uh, you've already had the preliminary studies and we'll start you uh, right in with it. We have, we have covered the time uh, from the anointed cherub that covereth here uh, and his fall from heaven, the son of the morning, and his betrayal of mankind and his determination to destroy man and God's determination that the seed of the woman would bruise the serpent's head. We took you through dispensation of conscience and human government, and we brought you to this area here called the dispensation of promise. We have a much finer way of saying that in this. When God began to say, I will bruise the head of the serpent, he finally found a man. Now, before this time, it was who who would save the world? From where would this one come who would bruise the head of the serpent? This deliverer, this savior, this Messiah. Here, God pinpointed it. It was no longer the whole of humanity. It was now down to a man. In, in the book of Genesis, chapter 12 and verse 2, God says to Abraham, I will make thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. <laughs> you see, God pinpointed it and says, the man, the man here, I will bless. Isn't it not amazing when God said that, immediately his wife Sarah was barren. They might have married when they were 30 years old. At 35, she had no child. At 40, she had no child. At 50, she had no child. Now she'd come to the time when women don't have children, and she still didn't have a child. Was it a natural thing? The Bible relates to us that it was not a natural situation, but it was something that the devil had done. Finally, we know the victory of it because we read in Genesis chapter 21, these remarkable words that the Lord tells us that Sarah did bear a son and his name was called Isaac. And so when we think of the great victory that God won. Now, the remarkable thing about the whole situation is this, that at that point in time, Sarah was 99 years old and Abram, her husband, was 100 years old and Isaac was born when you said it was a human impossibility, nobody was having children when they were 100 years old, and yet God did this thing, you see? It was part of the struggle of the ages. It was part of the battle that raged between man and the devil. And God won that battle, and Abraham had a son named Isaac. Does it not seem uh, uh, amazing to you that when God... I said, all right, through Abraham, all nations will be blessed. That was the Messiah. And then God said, and through Isaac, the nations will be blessed. I have to tell you that though Abraham wanted this son and Sarah wasn't capable of bearing him a son, that some human thinking came into process. And he said, I must have this son that God promised me. But God promised it through the seed that had been chosen, you see, Sarah. 
the seed. And so he goes and gets him a concubine, and he has a child named Ishmael by her, and God says, I will not accept that, that the seed of Ishmael cannot save the world. I cannot accept that. Only will I accept it through Sarah. And so man was trying to help himself to be a savior, and it didn't work. And neighbors, there are a lot of little Ishmaels running around our houses today, you know. God makes a commitment and says it'll be done this way, and I want it to be done this way. And we says, well, I, I can find another way to do it. I can do it by the arm of the flesh. I, I can do it in a more natural way. And there we've got our problems. Abraham's problem that he created with Ishmael, <laughs> we have with us today in Israel still. 3,000 years later, we have the human problem with us because man left the spiritual and engaged in the human. Neighbors, if you're going to win the battle of life, it must be done by the Spirit. We must live in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, think in the Spirit, act in the Spirit, or we cannot fulfill the dimensions that God has placed us in. So I urge you, don't go to Ishmael. God can create Isaac. Even though it's not natural, even though it takes a miracle, God does miracles today. Now, please believe me, God does miracles now, and God will do a miracle for you. He'll help you. There is a battle raging. You're part of the battle, but the battle rages on to victory. It rages on to victory. It doesn't rage on to defeat. The devil is defeated. Sin is defeated. Unrighteousness is defeated. God's people and righteousness will reign forever. Now, let's believe it, you see, and let's stick with it because God is good, and we know God is good, and we stick right with God because in these things we know that God is good and right. And so here we find that as soon as God chose uh, Abraham, his wife was barren. God chose Isaac, his wife was barren. God chose Jacob, his wife was barren. For three generations this thing persisted. It could not have been a natural thing. It could not have been a natural thing. And then as you look further into this story, uh, I can't go into all the details of it. It would take such a long time. But notice, the oldest son of Jacob, the oldest son, in, in 1 Chronicles chapter 5 and verse 1, the, the, the record tells us there that Reuben uh, came in uh, to commit adultery uh, with Bilhah, uh, Jacob's concubine, his father's wife. And it was such a terrible thing that Reuben could not be accepted, you see. The devil says, now, if I can stop the oldest son here, from being the one that would bring the Messiah. If I can stop the oldest son, maybe I have liquidated the whole family of this man Jacob. And God had to go down the fourth son to Judah in order to find the one that through him, God for all this 4,000 years was seeking to bring a redeemer. And there was a battle raging, not to the natural eye, not to the natural ear. There was a battle raging by the prince and the power of the air that has moved from the Garden of Eden right straight through the whole story of humanity. The battle has raged. When you know this and I know this, we become soldiers. <laughs> we become soldiers in God's army. We begin to know how to fight and how to live and how to take punishment. When things go wrong, we, 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 we say, now, wait a minute, who am I going to fight? And you start looking for the devil to fight him to overcome him because we are part of that victory and you can be part of it in your own life. In each, in each of these generations, one after the other, Israel's going into Egypt was a trick of the devil, you know? That's right. He caused a famine to come in the land. They all go down to live in Egypt and there they were under the devil for 400 years. Now, please don't think that was an accident. They tried to destroy the royal seed. The devil wanted to destroy the seed. And so down in Egypt here, they sought to destroy them. They said, we will destroy the whole royal seed that God has said that he would use to save the world. We will destroy it. And so in Egypt, it wasn't a natural thing for Pharaoh to do this. He wasn't that kind of a man inside anyway. You see, he was a human being that loved to live. But the devil hated the people of Israel and used him as a tool. And neighbors, you can be a tool of the devil to hurt your family, to hurt the people you work with, to hurt your neighbors, to hurt your preacher, 
You can be a tool of the devil to hurt. We're in a battle. Don't be on the devil's side. Be on God's side. Please always be on God's side in this great battle. For 400 years down here, the devil says, well, I've won this victory. These, these, these people here, I'm going to destroy them. And then he says, now, I know what to do. I will destroy the firstborn son. I will res res destroy all the males of the children of Israel. What was he trying to do? He was trying to destroy the Messiah. He didn't want this one to come who would bruise his head and destroy his power and his force. He says he must not come. He must not come. And away down through here, through the vicissitudes of the generations, he way down here said to Pharaoh, let's kill all the boys. Well, it's crazy to kill all the boys. How are you going to have men without boys? How are you going to have slaves without, you see? It was an idiotic thing to do. But if you serve the devil, he'll make you do idiotic things. And, and so the king says, I'll destroy all the boys. All the boy babies must die the day they're born. But God said something else. God said there'll be a seed. And you know the story. Moses. Moses became that seed, you see. Moses became that seed. Miriam, the mother of Moses, says, I am not afraid of the king. I'm not afraid of the emperor. I, I'm, I'm not afraid of the monarch. I'm not afraid. She took her baby the day he was born rather than giving him up to be destroyed. She put him in a beautiful little basket. Set him down right where the princess would go bathing. <laughs> she didn't hide him. Put him right where the princess would go bathing. She shot for big stakes. She says, rather than destroying him, I'll put him on the throne. That's fighting. That's part of the warfare. She didn't sit home and cry and say, oh, the king's going to kill all the little boys. I'll go give mine up. He's going to, no, no, no. She realized there was a battle going on, not to the natural eye, but to the spiritual eye. There was a battle going on, and she was part of the battle, and she won. She took her son, sailed him along right in front of the princess. The princess says, oh, look what a beautiful child. God won again. And rather than dying, Moses lived for 40 years right in the king's palace with all the wisdom of Egypt, with all the wisdom of the wise people. He lived there for 40 years, and then God spoke to him and said, through you. I'll bring a Messiah. Through you, I'll bring a Messiah. And so God delivered the people of Israel from Egypt. Now, do you think all those things that happened in Egypt were natural things? Why was it so hard to get the children of Israel out of Egypt with all ten plagues? And did you realize it? That every one of those plagues represented a deity? You ought to study that sometime. Every plague represented one of the Egyptian deities. Every time God made a stroke, he made a stroke at one of the devil's powers. He made a stroke at one of those wicked devils that was trying to destroy, you see. Uh, every time a plague came, whether it was uh, uh, the water to blood, the frogs, the lice, the flies, the murin, the boils, the hail, the locusts, the darkness, whatever it was, it was a strike at one of the deities, at one of the devils of Egypt. Well, it was a prince of the power of the air that caused the whole thing. So it was a battle, you see. Now, you're part of that battle today. Many things are happening to us today that show us that we're part of this battle today. But don't lose the battle. Don't get discouraged. Don't sit in the corner and whine. Put on your fighting clothes and step out in the front and say to the devil, I'm ready for you. I have on the armor of God. I'm going to win. And you will win. But you've got to know there's a battle first. And so... Here, uh, Moses, and here's a great point. Uh, when Moses was to, dis was to save the people of Israel, he goes out with his own natural strength and, and smites an Egyptian. Well, he shouldn't have done that. That wasn't God's way of doing this thing. And so he lost out and had to go into the wilderness for another 40 years. What it took uh, the Pharaohs 40 years to put into him, it took God 40 years to get out of him. To know that this, the warfare is spiritual. The warfare is supernatural, you see. And so you've got to know this. If you're going to take your own sword and go out and smite an Egyptian, well, you're going to go to the desert for 40 years too and learn that this battle of the hemispheres is a spiritual battle and you've got to fight it spiritually. Our, as our text that I wrote, read to you in our last lesson, our warfare has to do with principalities and powers of darkness. It does not have to do with flesh and blood. Uh, that's in Ephesians chapter 6. And so please know that and please believe that and always fight in that way. And so all these plagues came and, uh, and, and then God moved the children of Israel 
out of Egypt. And the devil, every step they made, tried to destroy them, tried to destroy them from being God's anointed. He had them to worship a calf, a golden calf, you see, in order to, so that they couldn't get his head bruised. He, he told them to grumble and to mumble at God, to grumble at Moses for 40 years, struggling uh, through this vast wilderness here. For 40 years, they wandered around and around and around here, trying to get there, but they couldn't get there because there was a battle raging. There was a battle, there was a battle raging. Finally, when God got them into the promised land, notice the battle that began there. Every time God chose a judge, that judge got into trouble. When God chose Samson as a judge, along came Delilah. Do you think Del Delilah was an accident? Oh, she was not. The devil put her there to destroy the promised seed. She was a heathen and a pagan. And the devil put her there to destroy the man of God and, and to destroy what God wanted to do. You must realize that. In every one of these judges, you find down they went because there was a battle there. Now, the reason the judges didn't win many times, they didn't understand the battle. They didn't know what was going on. And that would be the reason that they lost, you see. They didn't understand the battle. And on through the judges, for all those hundreds of years, through the judges, and then when they went into the kings, notice what happened. The first one was Saul. Surely he would bring the seed, you know. Surely Saul would bring the seed, you know, at, at, uh, and, and, and save the nation. And immediately the devil had him proud, covetous, and in witchcraft. You think that was an accident? Oh, don't ever believe that. Please don't believe that. It's part of this battle we're talking about. When God chose David, all hell turned loose on him. If he'd have stayed out there with the sheep, he'd have never had a problem as long as he lived, I guess. Just been a sheep herder till he died. But when he became God's man of the hour, everybody hated him. Everybody was against him. Oh, the problems and the sorrows he had. Everybody downgraded him. Bathsheba didn't come across his path for nothing. The devil saw that in Bathsheba, he had an instrument there to destroy him. And so uh, he had his problems. And when God chose Solomon, look at the problems that he had. All of these wives he had, that wasn't the desire of God. Our battle is not in flesh and blood. Our battle is in the world of spirit. And Solomon gave himself to that. And then in the divided kingdom, when the kingdom was divided, and, and some were taken into Babylon, and, and, and they were taken to various parts of the world as, as slaves. What was the devil trying to do? To destroy the seed. God said it would be Abraham's seed. The devil says, I'll put you all over the world where nobody will ever f even find your seed. I'll scatter you to the ends of the earth. There won't be any seed. I'll put you over there with the heathen and you'll intermarry with them and there'll be no promised seed because now God had said through a man, I'll do this. God had no longer said through the human race, I'll do it as he did back here. It was a seed of woman. But when it got here, it got to the seed of Abraham. And when it got over here, it got to be the seed of David. You know, God was bringing it down to a, a, a narrow point all the time as to who the savior of the world would be. But all through here, the divided kingdom where he, he scattered the people and put them under the heel of Babylon, raised up Daniel and tried to make him sell his soul for wine, women, and a song. And Daniel said, it's not for sale. I don't want to eat of the king's meat. and I don't want the king's girls. I'm going to live for God. And he stood for God there in Babylon and, and, uh, and prophesied and told us what would be in these last days. And so God finally brought these people back out of this bondage and brought them into their own land. For what reason? So the Messiah could come. God doesn't have a moving day just to have a moving day. God doesn't scatter people and bring them back just for the fun of it. God was seeking to bring the Messiah to the earth. God was seeking to bring a Savior to the earth. And so God had to go and pick up all these remnants, all these remnants, God had to pick them up, bring them back into the Holy Land, into Palestine, and to get them ready so that he could find the Virgin Mary. <laughs> and, and through her, he could bring a Savior to the world. Oh, friends, it's the most exciting story in the world. There is no story so exciting as this story. And when you know the battle of the ages and you know how to live and you know how to fight, it makes you a new person, a brand new person. It makes you know something that you, oh, it makes life really worth living.
And I hope you are coming now to feel this thing like I feel it, that you and I are caught up in the battle of the ages and we are not afraid in the battle and we're not in it to lose. We're in it to win. And Jesus has already made the master stroke right here, right here at Calvary. And notice when Jesus was born, how the battle didn't end there. Immediately Herod had it in his heart to kill all the male babies down there in Bethlehem. All the male children were destroyed in Bethlehem. Do you think that was an accident? You, you think he was just a bad man? He didn't go around killing babies, believe me. Herod didn't go around killing babies. He wasn't that kind of a man. But the devil put it in his heart. This man you must stop, that man Jesus. He didn't realize that God had already shipped Jesus somewhere else to preserve him, uh, that he didn't realize that. Uh, and, and so the devil had him to go down and to kill all of these people, all these little children down in Bethlehem. And then with the, the life of Jesus. God only knows during those first 30 years how many times God had to save his life. <laughs> I just imagine that almost every day there had to be a miracle to save his life. The devil was trying to chop him down all the way. But when he declared himself, when he declared himself in his ministry and he went out to save the world with his three and a half years of ministry before him, then problems arose, sorrows arose. Everybody was against him. They fought him in every way that they possibly could. And finally, finally, and I'd like to say this very strongly, finally, the religion turned against Jesus. The religion turned against him. Uh, the, the, the heads of religion uh, turned against him. And then the political turned against him. Uh, Rome turned against him. Do you think this was a natural thing? He was a good man. Jesus said, for which one of my deeds do you condemn me? Well, they couldn't think of one. You see, there was no deed that he did that he could be condemned by. But it was the devil trying to keep him from going to Calvary. You see, the devil says, don't let him get to Calvary. I don't want my head, I don't want my head bruised, you see. I don't want him to, whatever... See, the devil didn't know how his head was going to be bruised. He only knew when the angels says, peace on earth, good will toward men. He knew the Redeemer had come. He knew the bruiser had arrived. He knew that the one that was to emancipate the human race was here. He knew that now. Now what he had to do was to destroy him if he could. In the temptation of Jesus, don't think that was a natural thing. Someone says, do you think that was in the spirit? I certainly don't. The devil stood by Jesus just as alive as you see me right now. He talked with him. They talked together, and he wasn't talking to a spook. He was talking to the one that he was going to bruise his head. And, and through his temptation, the devil seeking to tempt Jesus. I'll put that in a lesson sometime. He tempted him body, soul, and spirit just like he tempted Eve, first with the bread, and then with the publicity, the pride, or the mind, and then with the spirit when he said worship him. He tempted him the same way he did Eve, body, soul, and spirit, because that's the three component parts of the human three of them. He wants to destroy all three of them, and you have to fight him in all three worlds. But we find that all through the ministry of Jesus, Jesus had to fight him all the way. And then the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. And the devil thought, well, I've won at last. I've won. But he was fooled that Christ took the cross and turned it into a throne to rule the hearts of men. Christ took the cross and made it an altar, made it an altar where men could come and worship forever and forever. When Christ expired on that cross, he went down into the bowels of the earth and he found the very throne of Lucifer and he pulled him off that throne and down in the innermost parts of the recesses of this earth, a battle was fought that has never been known in heaven, earth, or hell before. And he bruised his head. And up through the recesses of the bowels of the earth, there came the Savior. And he walked out on the resurrection morning into the garden of God, <laughs> in the resurrection garden, when he walked out into the resurrection, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And he said, I have the keys of hell and death. And all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. <laughs> oh, friend, Lucifer's head was bruised. The keys were gone. Jesus had them now. The battle had been won. How glad we are for it. That we can present to you at this time the victor of the ages. The one who has won, totally won, 
and he says to you and to me, join the victory parade. But the devil has not been incarcerated yet. He is still running free. He has not been, his head has been bruised. His power has been broken. The smallest saint of God can make him run. You couldn't have done that before Calvary. The smallest saint of God can say, I resist you, and he's defeated. But now we want you to know you have victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe me and win your battles. Lord, bless these, my friends, right now. Let them become very conscious of their place in God and of the victories won through the bruising of the head. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. It's been so wonderful having you with us for this study. There'll be further studies, and I hope that you can receive all of our studies. There will be many studies on the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, and all of my total ministry. And we want you to enjoy it from time to time. And may the good Lord bless you and keep you. And why don't you remember this day by day, that if you would, if, if you would uh, feed your faith, and if you would deny your doubts by starving them, then you would, your doubts would die and your faith would live. Let your faith live and your doubts die.